from the almost uh, sunny Copenhagen. Welcome to the webinar, How Super Escos Can Bypass Regulatory Restrictions for Contracting Private Escos, hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Aris, I'm working as a program officer at the Copenhagen Center, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. A couple of things before we move to the main content of uh, our webinar. This webinar is going to be about 60 minutes long, including time for Q&A at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end or you, you want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and the recording of the whole webinar will be available online in a few days. Before we start discussing about today's topic, I would like to inform our attendees that we comply with the General Data Protection Act, also known as GDPR. This means that your personal data, such as name, email, workplace, etc., is safely processed and stored in all of your rights pursuant to the GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data being processed about you and at any time you can request that inaccurate data be deleted or rectified. For access or further information, please call on with the people that are presented here. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. The center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for sustainable energy for all initiative. The center has an established network of global, regional and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. On a regular basis, the global ESCO network will be conducting webinars. All materials, including recordings and presentations from previous webinars, can be found on Global ESCO Network Library under the webinar section. The material of today's webinar will be uploaded shortly, but until then, you can check one of the many webinars in various topics that we have been published until now. Now I would like briefly to introduce the speakers of today's topic. Soren is working as senior economist at UNEP DTU Partnership. He has a PhD in climate policy with experience from 10 years of service in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Stefan. Stefan is the CEO of uh, uh, Wattraka. In 2020, he joined uh, Abu Dhabi Energy Service and uh, the Abu Dhabi Super Esco as chief operating officer. The Abu Dhabi Energy Services mission is to retrofit government and commercial buildings in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi to save electricity and water. Previously, uh, Stefan did create the ESCO activities for NG in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. In 2013, he founded and managed Etihad ESCO, the, the Dubai government super ESCO, uh, a first in the Middle East region. Finally, I would like to inform that you can send us your questions during the presentations using the dedicated icon, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Please do not forget to mention the name of the panelist that the question is for. And now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Soren. Thank you very much, Aris. My name is Soren Rutkin, and uh, I'm the chairman of the Global ESCO Network. Uh, and I'll just very quickly run through um, the background for, uh, of, of the Global ESCO Network. It was established in 2020. Uh, in fact, we started discussing uh, its establishment back in 2019 with the idea of organizing uh, ESCO associations around the world. We have by now 29 partners, which uh, represents about 80% of all ESCO associations uh, that we at least know of. As you can see on the map here, all the uh, countries that are in green um, are members either directly or indirectly of the Global Esco Network. The blue ones are the ones that we still hope to be including in 2022. We established uh, the network with the hope to fill a gap or two. First of all, we thought that um, ESCOs are simply missing in the global climate change agenda. We do not see ESCOs uh, represented. There's a lot of uh, focus on energy efficiency, and there has been that since the very beginning of the climate change agenda, but the actual implementation modalities have not been addressed uh, sufficiently clearly, 
uh, and particularly the ESCO uh, has not been figuring uh, prominently in uh, climate change discussions. We thought with the ESCO being such an efficient instrument that uh, they deserve a much better uh, representation in the climate change uh, fora and, and discussions. Uh, further, there was no real forum for ESCO associations exchange of experience. There's a lot of national focus. Uh, there's a lot of national um, build up of experience, but there is no exchange of that experience across uh, countries uh, or continents. And we thought the global ESCO network will be ideal uh, to fill that gap. And maybe a third gap that we also saw uh, is that uh, there was no repository for authoritative literature on ESCOs. Uh, of course, everybody can make their own search on, on, uh, on the internet, but we have with our website, as you can see here, the Global ESCO Network, established uh, a library of uh, what we think is um, the most authoritative uh, literature uh, that we can uh, come across at least <coughs> Sorry, uh, we have put that uh, in uh, the library for, for you to access. So we welcome you to check out the Global Esco Network um, to see uh, or to find your, your, your resources there. We are a new organization. Uh, we have been in active existence for a bit more than a year, maybe one and a half year. Um, so we are learning, and we are still uh, learning uh, on a steep learning curve on, on the, how we can best promote uh, the ESCO. Um, what we definitely know by now and through dialogues with our members is that energy efficiency does not happen sufficiently quickly by itself, and it needs regulatory intervention. We've seen that also uh, with data from uh, the International Energy Agency that the Dynamics, the dynamics of uh, energy efficiency improvement um, as energy intensity of the economy is not improving fast enough to be consistent with uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, it stands currently at about 2%, maybe even less than 2% energy uh, efficiency improvement of the global economy, whereas the estimates is that we actually need to double that. So we need to actively promote the energy uh, uh, the efficiency agenda, and governments do that, but very often they get uh, they get the instruments wrong, um, and oftentimes we see interventions, in fact, work directly counter to escrow involvement, and we see that particularly uh, now in uh, recovery programs post COVID nineteen. At least we recorded that both in the US and Japan and Chile, uh, where third party financiers are specifically excluded from support programs. And of course, that then means that ESCOs do not only have to work with their own barriers, but now governments are actually in, uh, implementing additional barriers. So, in the form of uh, competition from grant programs uh, that the ESCOs cannot benefit from. We instead recommend that the ESCO industry is used actively uh, as uh, implementation partner for all those uh, initiatives, all those recovery programs that are established uh, for, for the post-COVID-19 period. We also see that government interventions on energy efficiency are commonly isolated and program-based. And most importantly, they are turning a generally uh, profitable investment in energy efficiency into an expense for the government. These activities should not become expenses. As soon as they do, they also become temporary. Um, and with that also not a, a solid basis for developing a market for uh, the ESCOs. ESCOs require not only a standalone short-term program, in fact, they require an entire ecosystem. Uh, that includes um, not only regulatory frameworks, it could include uh, uh, authorization or uh, it, it could include uh, 
standards for contracts, standards for monitoring and evaluation. Uh, so that there, there are different elements, not least, of course, also uh, in some cases, at least financing models that ESCOs can benefit from. Uh, so all those elements um, need to be in place, not only one of them, but in fact all of them, in order for the ESCO industry to thrive. Um, and that means that using ESCOs for these energy efficiency interventions becomes a very strategic decision for governments. And that, in fact, means that it is specifically well suited for those uh, NDC processes, uh, national determined contribution, development under the Paris Agreement, which is, in fact, the focus of the global ESCO network's work. What we are currently running uh, through activities and dialogues with uh, our partners in the network is um, we, we, are, we, are, we are looking at uh, regulatory barriers. We are trying to analyze regulatory barriers, both in existing regulation, but in fact also in non-existing regulation. The obvious uh, barriers in existing regulation uh, are relatively easy to, to identify. They're not all the same in all countries. Uh, some relate to procurement rules, some relate to financing rules and the public sector particularly. We see particularly the barriers in the public sector interventions and not so much in uh, the private sector uh, interventions. In fact, when we see barriers in private sector interventions, if you recall that a barrier, it is uh, where regulation is missing. So there's no requirement, for instance, for energy audits in many, in many countries, at least. There's no requirement uh, for energy audits in, in industry. Uh, in those countries where there is, you mentioned India, for instance, uh, there is um, normally not a, a requirement to implement whatever is identified as a, a energy efficiency uh, opportunities. In India here, it's uh, also moving uh, uh, a step further. There's, an, in fact, a requirement to implement the identified energy efficiency uh, interventions. Uh, so there is, when there is uh, uh, regulation of that kind, uh, we consider this, in this analysis at least, as a barrier which has been removed, whereas, in fact, this is uh, uh, looking at the barriers in non-existing regulation. Um, we have one, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the existing regulations uh, where, where um, ESCOs are struggling to get into the market is mostly in the public sector. We have one solution here which we believe there is a lot of potential in, and that is the super ESCO. Uh, and that is why we uh, are looking much forward to the presentation today uh, by Stefan de Chantier uh, about how to use the super ESCO to circumvent those regulatory barriers that are oftentimes uh, seen, particularly in the public sector. So I thank you very much for your attention here. I would uh, hand over the microphone to Stefan for uh, the presentation of how we use the super ESCO to improve uh, the conditions for ESCO work in the public sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soren. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Stefan, and uh, I'm going to talk about super ESCOs this afternoon, uh, and especially how, how the super ESCOs are... Um, allowing the ESCOs to strive in markets where it's a bit difficult, especially with the uh, public sector. So just um, in my presentation, I'll, I'll reintroduce the concept of ESCO quickly. Uh, not everybody may be totally familiar with what is an ESCO, uh, what is a super ESCO, and why governments would create uh, a super ESCO. And then we'll look at a few examples of super ESCO. Over the last few years, there were quite a number of, of super ESCOs that were created. Uh, and I think um, we we'll look also at uh, what needs to be done around the super ESCO for the super ESCO to succeed, and also some of the risk uh, around the, the super ESCO. So, just quickly about uh, an ESCO, ESCO, so Energy Services Company. 
So it's a company uh, specialized into uh, providing turnkey energy efficiency services. And one of the particularity of ESCOs is that often they offer what we call a, an outcome guarantee uh, to their uh, clients. So this is usually under the form of um, uh, guaranteeing the results of the project in terms of uh, volume of uh, savings that are generated. Uh, or it can be also in the form of uh, the, the ESCO uh, financing the work and then just repaying itself on the uh, savings that are being generated. So ESCO has to ensure that there are savings, otherwise they cannot be uh, repaid. So what an ESCO does is usually uh, auditing buildings to evaluate the, uh, the potential for savings. They also identify um, all the where is the energy consumed in the uh, in the building. That's the baselining, and uh, all the sources of waste. So where is the energy used that is not uh, useful, or where is the equipment that is not efficient that could be uh, improved? And from there, they define the energy savings measures uh, (ESMs) to generate the savings. So those are the measures that could be put in place in order to uh, generate savings for electricity, uh, water, or other sources of energy. But the ESCO is not just uh, uh, doing this. The ESCO is also installing those um, uh, defined ESMs and making sure that they are operational for a number of years. So this is the contract that they sign with the client for a number of years. And the ESCO will install those ECM, ESM, sorry, and will um, make sure that they maintain them so that they can be operational uh, until the end of the contract. And ultimately, they will measure, verify, and guarantee uh, the savings to, to their clients. Optionally, some ESCOs will also finance uh, the projects. Uh, and that's what we call the uh, shared savings uh, model, where the ESCO will finance the project and then just getting paid on the uh, savings that are being generated by sharing a percentage of the savings uh, with the uh, with the with the client. Um, ESCOs are active in multiple building sectors, uh, commercial buildings, public sector buildings, but also industrial facilities uh, and multi-residential buildings. So usually you'll have ESCOs that would be focusing um, uh, mostly on commercial and public sector buildings. And then you have more specialized ESCOs that we look at industrial facilities uh, focusing at um, process uh, the process in certain industries or focusing on uh, things that could be done in the industrial facilities to um, uh, reduce the uh, the consumption could be like waste heat recovery it could be things like uh, improving um, compressed air or these kind of uh, things and in multi residential residential buildings um, schools would f would focus not on the individual um, I would say uh, apartments, but more on the uh, common areas of buildings, trying to improve the central, could be central air conditioning or, or central uh, boilers or, of uh, multi-residential buildings, lighting and this kind of thing. So really the focus of the ESCO is to improve everything that consumes energy. So lighting, uh, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, uh, the control systems that go with them, that, that manage the um, uh, the building. Uh, ESCOs would also look at the insulation of the building, so the envelope of the building could be looking at uh, roof isolation, could be things like replacing windows uh, and additional things related to insulation. In some of the countries where water is a, is really a, a scarce uh, resource, ESCOs would also focus on improving uh, the water consumption, so finding ways to reduce uh, Water. Uh, it could be water used in the building, but also water used outside of the building uh, for gardening or this kind of uh, uh, things. And in industrial, as I mentioned, it could be things related to waste heat uh, recovery, compressor systems, industrial cooling, uh, a lot of the things. But usually in, in, in the industrial sector, it's a very uh, specialized activity, and some ESCOs are, are very specialized in, into this. One other element is that ESCOs would also, um, are also able to install uh, decentralized renewable energy uh, under the form typically of solar 
photovoltaic or, or hot water. Uh, but usually that comes at the end. So the, the primary exercise is to reduce the consumption and then look at uh, alternative sources through uh, renewable energy. Now, what is a super ESCO? So you have ESCOs in the market, but why uh, do we need a super ESCO and, and what, is, what is it? So usually a super ESCO is a specific dedicated organization and quite often set up as an independent company uh, created and funded by a, a government, which could be local or federal. Uh, or, and we'll see that uh, later in the presentation, uh, also by the private sector. But mostly it's by governments. Uh, and the idea is that the Super ESCO is appointed to manage um, a building retrofit program for the public sector buildings to save energy. The reason why a government would create a Super ESCO is that uh, the idea is to concentrate all the knowledge, all the competencies into one organization so that things could go faster instead of uh, having each public sector entity trying to retrofit its own buildings uh, where the, 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 there would be a lot of um, knowledge that would not be uh, concentrated and that would be more difficult. Usually, um, Supresco is the result of uh, a government strategy to rationalize the energy demand. Uh, this is something that can be called a demand side management strategy. And out of the demand size management strategy, there, which usually has multiple programs, one of them is to focus on the public sector uh, buildings. And a, a good solution is to create a, a super ESCO to give the objective uh, and the KPIs and the goals on uh, retrofitting the, um, uh, the government buildings. So uh, a super ESCO, when appointed, uh, would define its own strategies to improve the um, the buildings from the uh, from the government, and also indirectly can contribute to improving the efficiency of the private sector buildings. We'll we'll also see that uh, later. So the main roles of a super ESCO is really, uh, and I'm talking here in the public sector only, uh, is is really to facilitate and optimize the retrofitting of the uh, government buildings. So the Super ESCO would, will elaborate a strategic plan to address the, um, the target that was given um, in terms of savings. It will um, realize energy audits or energy uh, investigations, I would say, of the public buildings to identify the, uh, the opportunities and the, the, the project feasibilities. Uh, then it will group and organize the procurement of buildings um, through um, uh, the ESCO. So the idea is that the super ESCO will, uh, will uh, select a number of buildings from a number of entities, then we'll organize public tenders uh, so that ESCOs can respond and uh, participate in those tenders and be selected to uh, execute the, uh, the retrofit. So, the Super ESCO will then manage the execution of the ESCO project, so supervising uh, the ESCOs that are being selected to execute the work. Very important also, the Super ESCO will finance or organize the financing of those projects. And one of the reasons is that it's um, if the Super ESCO doesn't have the, uh, the, the funding, it's going to be very difficult to convince the government entities that they should invest into retrofitting their buildings. It's also complicated because some government entities may not have a budget for this, so they would have to require a specific budget. This would uh, need to uh, go through a budgeting cycle, so it could take a long time before the government entities would have a specific budget for, for improving their buildings. So if the super ESCO has the finance and is able to fund the, the project, then that's one less barrier, and that's one way to really uh, execute project uh, faster with government. The Super ESCO will also verify uh, the savings uh, that are realized by the ESCOs and then in general ensure that the ESCOs are fulfilling their promises uh, in terms of uh, the project that uh, is being contracted, so what are the measures that are being sold, the savings that are generated, and also uh, ensuring that the maintenance is properly done uh, over the years. 
here we have an example of um, how it works between uh, the three parties, so the super ESCO, the, the private ESCO, and the building owner. Uh, when an ESCO has been selected as a result of a tender by the super ESCO, then the ESCO will execute uh, the building retrofit, so in, uh, install uh, the, the ESMs on the building to improve the, uh, the energy consumption. The super ESCO will be paying uh, the private ESCO for the work. And in return, the private ESCO will provide a guarantee on the savings to the super ESCO. And then the super ESCO will uh, provide that guarantee to the building owners and uh, will uh, obtain the repayment for the retrofit from those building owners. And usually, the way it is done when the super ESCO is, is funding the project is that the repayments from the building owners is not higher than, than what was the um, uh, the initial payment, uh, the, the sorry, the payment for energy that uh, they were paying before. So for the building owners, it could be a very transparent uh, project in terms of budget, because they could pay the same as before, uh, just that the savings that are being generated cover the uh, cost of the project. So I'll take a few examples of super ESCOs uh, that have been established over the years. The first one being the um, Energy Efficiency Services Limited in India, established in 2009. It's owned by the Indian government under the Ministry of Power. Uh, it's a JV between several uh, organizations under the Ministry of Power. And the uh, EASL focus on... Um, solution-driven innovation with no subsidy or capital expenditure for the client. So they have a model of pay as you save. So exactly what I was describing before is like only when there are savings that uh, the clients are paying. So this is extremely attractive for, for the um, clients. Um, ESL has a particular model in all the, the super ESCOs that have been uh, created until now because they are not using private ESCOs to develop uh, their activities. In fact, they are more like um, a procurement organization for the government. So they they procure a very large amount of uh, efficient products. Could be uh, lighting products like LEDs, uh, efficient fans, efficient air conditioners, and these kind of um, things. And then they resell them to the government entities uh, with a small fee. Uh, so they are really more like a, a, a super procurement organization, and uh, they've been extremely successful. I mean, in terms of uh, the, the probably the, the, one of the biggest uh, success is this LED lighting program, where they've been sourcing a lot of um, lights and then replacing uh, LEDs in many of the uh, government uh, entities across India. They've been working on uh, also uh, street lighting projects, replacing uh, large quantities of street lights, and also on projects such as uh, efficient fans, uh, efficient air conditioners. Uh, recently, they've been also sourcing um, uh, charging uh, infrastructure for, for electric vehicles. So I would say this is a, a little bit of a particular model for a super ESCO, but they've been extremely successful and have created a lot of uh, savings for for India, uh, but they're not they are not really developing the ESCO market uh, as such. Now another super ESCO um, that was created in the UAE in uh, 2013. So I was personally involved with it. Um, it's uh, Etihad ESCO. It uh, it is owned by the Dubai government through the Electricity and Water Authority, so DWA. Uh, the uh, Etihad Esco has an objective to retrofit 30,000 buildings in Dubai to save 1.7 terawatt hours of electricity and 5.6 billion of uh, imperial gallons of water by 2030. Uh, the benefit from a government directive uh, that is helping uh, its work uh, with the public sector entities, but this is not a very strict um, directive. And we'll see after that uh, the importance of that. Um, I think Etihad ESCO initiated the ESCO market in the UE because they, it was the first organization that really started to work with ESCOs um, in the UE, and they rely on third-party financing. So they don't they don't finance themselves, but they have a partnership, uh, notably with the um, Dubai Green Fund, 
uh, to fund the project that it uh, realized. So by September 2020, um, Tiadesco had done 22 projects and retrofitted more than 7,000 buildings. And you see the numbers that uh, they generated in terms of savings, 300 um, gigawatt hours of electricity and 289 million imperial gallons of water. So there is still work to be done to reach the, the targets set for 2030. But a lot of work has been done uh, by ETH Esco. Now, another super ESCO, uh, a bit later, that was created in Saudi Arabia called Tarshid. This is the National Energy Services Company. Uh, established in uh, 2017, and this is a uh, super ESCO owned by the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. Um, they focus on retrofitting public sector buildings exclusively, so not at all in the private sector or, or in the industrial sector, uh, across Saudi Arabia, and they use uh, private ESCOs to execute the work. Uh, they've been capitalized with $500 million at start, uh, to fund the project. So it's an interesting model where the company was created and uh, with a, a very large capital. Uh, and it, it is in, it, the company itself is funding the project um, to, to retrofit the, uh, the buildings. Very importantly, and that's probably unique so, so far that I, I've seen uh, globally, is that they benefit from a royal decree that is mandating the public sector entities to contract with them on an exclusive basis. So what that means is that all government entities in Saudi Arabia have been mandated to retrofit their buildings and to do it exclusively with Tarshid. So this has resulted into Tarshid um, uh, doing multiple, I would say, uh, hundreds of projects uh, very quickly uh, since 2017. Uh, they've also uh, executed a street lighting replacement program for 2.5 million street lights. This is probably one of the biggest um, street lighting replacement program globally. This program is almost uh, completed now. Um, and you can see that mid-2020, they announced having already achieved um, one terawatt hours of um, reduction in energy consumption. So energy consumption. So that's extremely fast, given that they were established in 2017. So one of the benefits that they had is really this royal decree that is helping them a lot. And one other thing that they've been doing is, is to standardize the contracts, um, both with the ESCOs. So they have a standard contract working with the ESCOs, but also a standard contract working with the their clients and, and those contracts usually are not being modified so then they can uh, really contract very fast when when things are being uh, uh, handed over to them another super ESCO that was created um, last year uh, in 2020 so abu dhabi energy services uh, i'm currently involved in this one as well uh, it's owned by the uh, abu dhabi government through uh, the electricity or the power company taka uh, which has for shareholder um, ADQ. Uh, the focus of ADES is on retrofitting public sector buildings in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi uh, using private ESCOs to execute the work. ADES is also funding projects so directly. So ADES is getting funding from, from its um, shareholders uh, to really uh, uh, finance the project of its clients. So clients have nothing to pay to be able to retrofit their buildings. So far, ADES has announced uh, uh, projects for the Ministry of Education for 200 schools with the um, healthcare organization, SAHA, uh, for 50 hospitals and clinics, uh, the UE University, and the Department of Culture and Tourism. And there are many others that are in the pipeline of um, ADES. Last example I would take, which is a very uh, it's a recent one and a very interesting one because this is the first one in the private sector. This is a, a super school called SOFIAC. It was created in Canada, in exactly in Quebec, uh, at the beginning of uh, this year. Uh, it's owned by um, two uh, private entities, so Econolor, which is uh, uh, a global uh, energy efficiency consultancy organization, 
and Fond Action, which is a specialized uh, fund uh, into that funds sustainable developments. Um, the focus of SOFIAC is really retrofitting private sector buildings in Quebec using private ESCOs to execute the work. So exactly as a public sector uh, ESCO, but focusing only on the private sector. And the idea is that the savings um, will, will covering the cost of the project uh, and they are funding the project. So they raised, and they announced it recently, they raised $200 million um, to finance the project through banks in Canada um, and, uh, and, and Fond Action. Uh, recently, so this is still a very new organization, but they organized, they announced recently uh, projects for uh, a large private school and the, I would say, a very interesting project, which is the airports of Montreal. Uh, so this is, a, for me, a very interesting uh, development in the domain of the super schools because it's the first time that there is a private sector super school being uh, set up. So it's going to be interesting to follow how it develops uh, because it could help really stimulate the market uh, for uh, the ESCOs. And I think their positioning is a lot uh, more on the funding. Uh, they, they position themselves as a fund to help the ESCOs execute projects. Now, how to ensure that the super ESCO is successful? Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and I'm talking here about the uh, public sector uh, super ESCOs. It's, uh, and I think we have a good example from Saudi Arabia. I think the, having a mandate for the super ESCO is really important to ensure that it is successful. So mandating the use of the super ESCO by the public entities, uh, that uh, allows the super ESCO to go very fast. Obviously, providing exclusivity also for the super ESCO. You don't want to see several super ESCOs competing against each other because that would uh, create a lot of confusion and, and uh, delays and, uh, and problems. Uh, but also with the super ESCO, there is a framework that needs to be um, uh, set uh, around the super ESCO. Things like what was done in Dubai, such as a, a, an ESCO accreditation scheme. It was also done in Saudi Arabia uh, with a licensing scheme for the ESCOs. Uh, standard contracts, that's a very important element that contract could be standardized so that uh, no time is lost in, in negotiations. Having a dispute resolution mechanism is also important so that ESCOs understand the mechanisms and if something goes wrong, what is going to be done. Uh, it's also important to um, standardize the measurement and verification protocol. This is more or less done today in most of the countries. Um, I think everywhere uh, uh, the super ESCOs and the ESCOs are using the uh, IPMVP International Protocol for uh, Measurement and Verification uh, by EVO, but it's important that it's being uh, set as a, pro as, a, as a standard. Then another element is to ensure that there is possibility to do government to government contracts. Uh, that's really important for the super ESCO because if this, so government to government contract means the a contract, a government entity can contract with another government entity uh, without uh, going to tender. And that's very important because that allows um, uh, the super ESCO to work directly with a government entity. If this does not exist, and this is the case in some countries, then it's a barrier for the super ESCO because the government entity has to organize a tender to be able to select the super ESCO uh, to work with it, even if it's a government entity. So for government, this is a very important element. Um, but then when this is in place, the super ESCO can uh, freely contract with other government entities. And the last element, which is absolutely key, is the funding. Uh, this needs to be set up at the same time as the uh, super ESCO. Either by, there are several ways. As, as we see in Saudi, they've created the super ESCO with directly the capital that allows it to, uh, to fund projects. Or like in Dubai, where the Super ESCO was, um, a fund was created next to the Super ESCO to help uh, fund the project. So, but, but funding needs to be done, needs to be there because most government entities will not have, um, funding available for, for their, for these kind of projects. 
one element also is that we need to be a bit careful because super SCOs are not always positive for SCOs. And I'm, I'm saying this because we see things happening in the market. I mentioned, for example, uh, India, uh, the example of India, and they use what we call a cherry picking approach versus a system approach. So instead of taking buildings or groups of buildings and then um, uh, giving them to ESCOs to look at the entire approach of buildings, uh, which is what we call the system approach, they use the cherry picking approach, which is, okay, we take, uh, we select lighting and we, we, we will source the lighting as the best um, possible cost. And then we replace the lighting in all the buildings at the same time. So it's a totally different approach. Uh, and cherry picking does not need ESCOs to, to do the work. So it's not a positive um, development for ESCOs. Uh, but fortunately, most of the super ESCOs would um, work with ESCOs under a systems approach. Another thing is that um, uh, there, there could be an attempt from the super ESCO to become a public ESCO because as they develop a number of projects, they start to learn a lot about ESCO work and how how an ESCO is doing the work, how the ESCO is sourcing um, energy efficient products, etc. So there is a risk that at some point the, the super ESCO will become an ESCO and do the work directly and not use the ESCOs anymore. So that's something that needs to be extremely um, uh, well looked at carefully by the government because most, in many cases, uh, creating a super ESCO is, is not just also linked to um, I would say retrofitting buildings. It's also a link to developing an ecosystem, developing companies, attracting investment from other countries, uh, establishing ESCOs, creating jobs. So if the super ESCO then suddenly becomes the only uh, ESCO doing the work, you lose a lot of those uh, elements. Other things that could happen is that the super ESCO would look at diversifying in other markets and lose focus in the own market. It could be other markets or other uh, type of activities, uh, also geographical markets, and then they start to lose focus. I think a super ESCO is set up for a very specific task and needs to be focusing on its own uh, market. Uh, and another risk that I could see is the uh, super ESCO focusing too much on profiti profitability of projects and not on maximizing the energy savings. There is a lot of um, debates on whether a super ESCO should be profit making or should it be um, like a, a cost uh, organization for, for, for government. Uh, we'll see if it's profit making. The temptation to to maximize the profit will go against the uh, uh, maximizing the energy savings uh, for for the government building. So this is also a point of attention for the super ESCOs. Now, uh, just as a conclusion, I think um, super ESCOs are a very powerful tool uh, to accelerate the deployment of energy efficiency projects for government. And now with the SOFIAC, we're going to see if this works in the private sector as well. Uh, so, uh, public sector super ESCO will require a proper regulatory framework. So it needs also to have the, the proper setup around it. it, needs to have the capacity to stimulate the market, uh, bring projects to the ESCOs in a fairly a uh, quick manner so that the ESCOs can be uh, uh, can can be very busy with the project of the super ESCO. Uh, a strong funding uh, mechanism needs also to be associated with the super ESCO to ensure that uh, there is client interest and that this is not a buyer, uh, the funding. And then ultimately, uh, the super ESCO will contribute uh, to create jobs through the work it generates with the private ESCOs and that uh, is a uh, very important element also for governments uh, that are looking to improve the, uh, the local jobs. Uh, with the work of ESCOs and super ESCOs is creating jobs locally in the country. So that's a very important element for, for our governments as well. So I will stop there and then uh, I think we can have um, the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Stefan, for the thorough presentation. Uh, as you mentioned, now it is time for the Q&A session. So uh, I would like to ask from our panelists to activate uh, the web cameras. So all the attendees will be able to see who is behind that event. Thank you very much. 
So we have a few questions, and uh, I just want to mention one more time to all the attendees that they, you can still send us your question. Please use the dedicated icon, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. So, Stefan, I'll start uh, with you, and the first question that we have is, should we consider the super ESCO as a financing solution for private sector ESCOs when working with the public sector? Yes, yes, uh, because the super ESCO is, is, can be funding the project. And that, again, was what I said during my presentation. If you don't have the funding with the super ESCO, then you, you create another issue to, to do the project because then the, the, the government's entity needs to have a budget for it. Sometimes they have. But in many cases, they don't have. And then if the Super ESCO is not funding the project, the project will not happen. So uh, for, for the ESCOs, having the Super ESCO is great because they remove the barrier of funding. Uh, because a, an ESCO could go see uh, uh, a government entity, which would be very interested, but would, do, would not have any budget to, to do the, the project. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is uh, includes transportation. And the question is, transportation is an area where great energy savings may be realized. Is transportation included in ESCO? Usually no, because uh, it's the, the ESCOs are usually focusing on buildings, on the building sector, and, and specifically on the existing buildings, not even on the new buildings. Uh, transportation is usually, uh, and that's something I saw uh, in the UE. This is being tackled at the, within the DSM strategy as a different program, uh, separate from the ESCO or the Super ESCO program. This is something that is uh, done separately, and it's usually linked to uh, electrification and facilitating electrification. The only element where a Super ESCO or an ESCO can contribute is and we have those requests from time to time is to as part of the project that we do when we retrofit the building is to install for example uh, ev charging points in the building so that uh, as part of the project we can uh, fund the um, the charging infrastructure but uh, it does i would say that's the only uh, transportation related element thank you uh, the next question is uh, how does a government or super esco balance creating energy savings via spurring or creating a strong ESCO market by providing quality projects to ESCOs and not a commoditized project? Yeah, I think that's one of the elements I mentioned. Uh, it's very important that the SuperESCO focus on, on developing as many projects as possible and avoid the temptation to uh, to yeah commoditize them so it would be very easy after having done a few projects to see oh i can simply maybe i can do the lighting myself because it's very easy and i i just buy lights and i, I get someone to install them uh, i think it's it's unfortunately it's something that um, needs to be uh, under the attention of the uh, the government that has created the uh, super esco because the super esco is the objective of the super is to make savings as fast as possible and as big as possible. So sometimes they could take some some short cuts to to do this, which are not in the interest of the ESCO. So, but uh, that's an element I was mentioning that is to make sure that there is trust in the market, that the ESCOs are interested to to bid in the project of the super ESCO. I think the super ESCO needs to be very transparent and fair in the way it does projects and the way it executes um, projects. The case of Saudi is very interesting because they, for example, to do the uh, uh, the retrofit pro program on the street lights, it would have been very easy for them just to buy the street lights and then to install them, uh, find installers to install them. But no, they decided to go through ESCOs. Uh, and uh, the reason was that uh, they could multiply uh, the number of ESCOs working in parallel uh, so that the program can be executed very, very fast. Uh, I think the limitation, if they were if they were to do it by themselves, it would be slower, uh, with more risks also. So having ESCOs remove the technical risk and then um, allows it to to have multiple projects in parallel. So so that's a benefit also of the that the super ESCO will have. Thanks. Uh, the next question is: When would be the right time to move on from super ESCO model and let the private ESCOs 
compete against each other. I think this is already this is happening from the start because the Super Esco is is mostly uh, working on the in the public sector, but there are private sector projects. Huh? Uh, multiple uh, in the UE, we have multiple projects happening without the Super Esco, and typically it could be like hotels that would be uh, looking at saving energy. In that case, they go after uh, ESCOs um, and then have them uh, compete uh, to provide the best uh, answer. There are also some large uh, retrofits that happen without um, the, the, the involvement of the Super ESCO. Uh, it's the case of uh, entities that uh, would hire like a consultancy uh, organization to help them set up the proper tendering process and then have the, the ESCOs compete and then provide the best offer. So all the, the solutions are possible. The Super ESCO is not just the unique uh, solution in the market. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, now, uh, Soren, I have a question for you and the question goes, how can I support your research on the regulatory barriers for ESCOs? Thank you, Aris. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we're we are doing research through our partner associations currently on, on the regulatory barriers in different countries. Um, as I also showed, we only have ESCO associations in a limited number of countries. So whoever is out there who is interested in helping us doing this analysis and spreading it beyond those countries where there are ESCO associations, um, we are very interested in talking to people who know of regulatory barriers for ESCOs in those markets. Um, just reach out, send us an email, we will be very happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, Stefan, is for you, I think, and the question is, the nature of a super ESCO is a public entity. How and why would they ever be looking at using this entity as a profit center? Shouldn't they be focused on saving energy or creating a private ESCO market? Yeah, this is this is so. Well, first of all, the super ESCO we see now that um, it's not just public sector because there is this example from Canada where it's it's a purely private uh, organization. But if we take the for the question the uh, public sector and uh, uh, super ESCO, uh, this is something that. Um, it's 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 a it's a debate in the sector because uh, the Supresco could be set up only as a government entity covering its costs with the objective to make savings, but it could also be created uh, as part of a fund uh, that from the government that that is for profit and that requires that the Supresco would return some some profit. So uh, the it's it's the alternatives are are there. Huh? Uh, so far, I think most of the ESCOs are somehow to uh, make some sort of profit. Uh, I mean, super ESCOs so to, to do some kind of profit, but not at the same levels. Uh, so that's that's something that, uh, yeah, it's it's the decision of the government uh, on whether they want the super ESCO to generate profit or to be focused entirely on its mission to, to make uh, savings. The next question, and I know we're go we are almost close to our, the end of the webinar, but we still have a little bit of time. Uh, the question is, can you clarify how super ESCOs can bypass regulatory restrictions? Yeah, the super ESCOs are not, not bypassing the, the regulatory restrictions, but they are facilitating the, um, uh, the work. I mentioned, for example, um, to, today, for example, a private entity is very difficult to contract with the uh, a government uh, sector entity, uh, the Supresco will facilitate that, facilitate the funding as well. Um, very difficult for a, a private ESCO to get funding from the government to do its work, which is in fact what's happening with the Super ESCO. Super ESCO is getting funding from uh, usually uh, government sources that it will give to the private ESCO to execute the project. So the, the, there are a number of things that the, the Super ESCO is doing uh, to, to really facilitate the work by um, the private ESCOs. Uh, some of the things may not be very visible uh, for the private ESCOs, uh, but there is a lot of uh, background work that uh, Super ESCO does uh, to facilitate and, uh, and uh, allows the, uh, the, the private ESCOs to, 
uh, be active on the market. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are very close to the end of the webinar. Uh, we received more questions, but we don't have time to continue uh, responding. So I would like to thank you for the detailed responses to the questions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of the webinar. I would like to say thanks to the panelists for the informative and interesting presentations and to the audience for their active participation. We hope that the presentation will be beneficial for all stakeholders involving in ESCOs and energy efficiency. Thank you for your attention and wish you a good day or night from Copenhagen.